joined by Chris Biederman, Sacramento B, and the Candlestick Chronicles. Chris Biederman, thank you for joining us. How was it watching the Super Bowl in Oklahoma City? Uh, yeah, it was it was cold and snowing, um, but I had a uh, wa- watch it in my hotel room was was hunkered down by myself. Text messages, group chats, everything going. So wasn't wasn't as lonely as it might have seemed uh, watching it by myself in a hotel room. But right. Um, definitely memorable. Does it feel like something and it's just a different way of asking, did someone win or did somebody lose? But did it feel like something went wrong for the Niners or they just never took advantage of something, things going wrong for the Chiefs? Yeah, you, you just have to mas- maximize every opportunity you have when you're going against Patrick Mahomes in a Super Bowl, right? I think he's he's going to go down as one of the best quarterbacks we've ever seen, and but that doesn't mean he was unbeatable. Obviously, Tom Brady and the Buccaneers beat him a, a few weeks ago, or a few years ago, excuse me, but... Um, yeah, like you know, you can't you can't have Ray Ray McLeod not falling on a punt, um, and and trying to scoop it instead of just recovering that. Um, and obviously that led to a touchdown. You can't be missing extra points. You know that's that's basically eight points right there in a game that goes to overtime. And mm-hmm. and you know that so there's that. And then there's you know Kyle Shanahan getting his his lunch eaten largely by Steve Spagnuolo on on third downs. I thought Brock Purdy played pretty well overall, and and a lot of the 49ers inability to get first downs or score touchdowns in, in key moments um, was mostly about play calling and was about schematic advantages that the Chiefs had, whether that be, um, you know, confusing the 49ers, taking advantage of some weaknesses along the offensive line, overloading them with, with blitzes. Um, it just felt like the Chiefs had a better game plan on that side of the ball. Um, and so that to me is, you know, it's not so much that Purdy wasn't, I thought Purdy overall was was pretty good, um, and he and he made some nice plays. But in those key moments, it felt like the Chiefs had a schematic advantage, and I'm sure that's something that Kyle Shanahan's going to take a hard look at throughout this off season. But no, I mean, you know, there, there's always conversation like, who do you blame? Um, I blame Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid, and and Steve Spagnola. Honestly, like they were just better than the 49ers. And you know, if you're of the mind that you want to cut players or fire coaches, I would tell you that you're not going to find any alternatives that are that are going to put you in a better spot to try beating Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid and Steve Spagnuolo. So it's just one of those things. Those guys are better. You tip your hat to them and, and you know, they're going to go down as some of the best to ever do it. Chris, uh, is there any moment, um, I guess, that that kind of sticks or it doesn't even have to be a moment, but just anything in general from that game that that sticks with you that you just feel like I guess can't get over isn't the right word, but it's just is is really sticking out to you about why the game ended up going the way it did. I was really surprised that they weren't able to get George Kittle involved and mm. they weren't really able to get Debo Samuel involved. Three catches on 11 targets for for a guy of his caliber um, is, you know, that's that's why you lose a game like that. And uh, just, you know, the 49ers came in. You thought, you know, you assumed Christian McCaffrey was going to have a big game because we know the Chiefs defense hasn't been great against the run. Um, but you know, Christian McCaffrey went off and, and Juwan Jennings went off and, and that was really it. You, you, you know, whether it was George Kittle having to be involved in pass protection, maybe more than you would have liked to compensate for some of the issues you had along the offensive line and, and the pass rush that, that the chiefs were able to generate, or whether it's, you know, Debo Samuel, just not being as good against man coverage as you need him to be, or just not having the opportunities to, to get Brandon Ayuk the ball more often, um, that to me, I, I think was was sort of the most, uh, I would say surprising, I guess, because we've seen the 49ers be able to get the ball to their playmakers really at any given moment throughout the regular season. Um, and that just wasn't the case, obviously, Sunday in the Super Bowl. And then again, the mistakes, you 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 fumble a punt. Um, I don't blame Daryl Luter for, for the ball just sort of randomly falling off his foot, but Ray Ray McLeod just has to fall on that. He had an opportunity to fall on it. Um, and obviously that goes for, for a touchdown in a game that goes to overtime. Obviously, every point matters there. So to me, those those were the things that that I'll think about going forward after after watching that game Sunday. Talking to Chris Peterman, Candlestick Chronicles and Sacramento B. Chris, I'm sure you saw everything. We're only we're barely 48 hours out of the out of the season ending and Brandon Ayuk's significant other and his brother had some things to say and Brandon Ayuk had some things to say as well he's under contract we dealt with this a couple years ago 
with Debo. Is there anything Brandon Ayuk is slated to make 14 million, which is a lot more than he's made these last couple years here? Is there anything to be worried about if you're a Niners fan? I mean, what we just watched this with Debo, and Debo was looking to get a contract. What do you think is going to happen here? It looks like Ayuk and his camp are upset about the targets, which is a surprise, surprise with the wide receiver being upset they didn't get the ball enough. Is there anything Niner fans should be worried about here? Um, you know, knowing Brandon, the the little that I do, I, I think it's probably stemming from frustration of just how the Super Bowl went, right? And the 49ers, the 40, I know the 49ers love Brandon Ayuk. And I think if you were to ask uh, a lot of important people in that building to a man, you know, who's the best pure wide receiver in that group? It is Brandon Ayuk. And, and that's not to take anything away from Debo Samuel, who is clearly one of the best players in the league with the ball in his hands. But in terms of an ability to beat man-to-man -man coverage, an ability to run basically every single route, the ability to be one of the most explosive downfield threats in the NFL, um, I would give the nod to, to Brandon Ayuk in those specific categories, not to say that Debo Samuel's not an elite player, because clearly he is. But it's just when it comes to those pure receiving fundamentals, Brandon Ayuk is that guy. Um, so I, I'm curious to see if the 49ers are willing to cash out both Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel at the same time in the sense that, you know, they, they can probably afford to do it in, in 2024 because they still have Brock Purdy on his rookie contract and he's not eligible to sign that new 40, $50 million a year contract, whatever that's going to be until after the coming season. Um, at which point the 49ers might have to decide between their receivers. But in terms of right now, I would imagine the getting Brandon Ayuk a new contract is going to be a top priority for them. And in doing so, that actually shrinks his cap number for 2024, essentially, right? You remember just about every single big contract the 49ers have signed. Um, the first year of those deals have, have led to a, a pretty small cap hit um, relative to you know what the annual averages are. So Brandon Ayuk's making $14 million a year. If he signs a deal, say, in the $25 million a year range, I would imagine that first you know, the 2024 cap hit probably goes down from 14 to something like five or six. Um, and we saw that with Debo Samuel in, in his first year of his deal in 2022 also. Um, so, no, I wouldn't read like too much into any displeasure. I think Brandon Ayuk is um, he knows how good of a coach Kyle Shanahan is for him. Uh, I know he loves Brock Purdy. I know he loved the way he was being used throughout the season. I think Brandon Ayuk's effort and in terms of the way he blocks for his teammates sort of speaks volumes and that he's not such, so much of a me first guy. Right. So I think this is um, whatever bad feelings there might be right now are probably just stemming from, you know, losing the Super Bowl and not being as good offensively as you as you wanted to be. Um, and I imagine the the money will talk and, and Brandon Ayuk will will eventually be happy. Chris, everything you just said is great. It's lovely. Um, but I watched the game on Sunday and the the best receiver for the 49ers, I don't know what you're talking about, is MVP Juwan Jennings. OK, what does the future hold for uh, for Juwan and, and the Niners? Uh, well, or is I there think any? He's a, yeah, I think he's a free agent and I think there's going to be another team out there that's that's going right. to be willing to pay him more than the 49ers will be. And and look, it's kind of the Kendrick Bourne blueprint, right? Like mm. Kendrick Bourne was was really valuable to the 49ers in their 2019 Super Bowl run. And then he went up, he wound up getting a, a bigger contract than the 49ers were willing to pay. Um, and then that led to the 49ers finding Juwan Jennings. And so right. I would imagine, given that the 49ers have, you know, they have two third round picks, two fourth round picks, and two fifth round picks in this year's draft, that that's going to be their avenue towards addressing the receiving core. And, you know, who knows if Danny Gray is, is going to um, evolve into something useful going forward. Um, but I would imagine that, you know, they're, that's that's part of the thing, right? Like when you have a really good team with a lot of high priced players, you're just going to lose some guys on the margins. And Juwan Jennings was super valuable to the 49ers, obviously, throughout his time with San Francisco and and obviously in the Super Bowl, super, super valuable player. Um, but I think if you're the 49ers, you got to prioritize signing Brandon Ayuk and hope you can, you know, draft another guy or find another undrafted free agent who ends up being as productive as, you know, your Kendrick Bournes, your Juwan Jennings. So that's where I think this is headed ultimately. Talking to Chris Biederman, Candlestick Chronicles of Sacramento B. Chris, I was going to go with the Kings question, but we got time to talk Kings. <laughs> I, I just want to finish out our our convo here with a question about George Kittle. What mm. was your thought process on George Kittle and the lack of 
action he saw offensively besides blocking and the lack of receptions and just attention that he got from the from I guess the the offensive team and and Brock Purdy was he blocking too much what the heck happened he said he was coming back with a vengeance and that vengeance was about four yards what happened yeah I mean he did make one of the biggest catches of the game to that point when he Mm -hmm. converted that fourth down um but it wasn't it wasn't a George Kittle game it was you know the Chiefs have a really good secondary and and had a really good plan obviously for all the 49ers playmakers and Kyle Shanahan decided that George Kittle was needed in pass protection a lot, which is, you know, it's it, 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 that cuts both ways, right? Like George Kittle is an immensely valuable player because of his ability to block both in the running game, obviously, and the passing game. But he's also an elite target as a as a receiving tight end. And you can only do one thing on any given play, right? Like he's not going to, he can't do pass protection and catch balls at the same time. So it's a delicate balance to strike. And I'm not going to pretend like I, I'm better at Kyle Shanahan or better than Kyle Shanahan at striking that balance. But I think it was just one of those games where, you know, the pass protection issues were to the point where Kyle Shanahan thought he needed George Kittle in those scenarios. And, and when, um, when Brock Purdy was going back to pass, he didn't have a whole lot of time to survey all of his options, and I'm sure there were more opportunities that that they would have liked to give George Kittle, but but ultimately they just weren't there in that moment. And I'm sure if you were to give Kyle Shanahan a a, a blueberry Red Bull vodka, uh, that he would say that, you know, I probably wish we gave George Kittle the ball in, in more key moments. Um, so it's it's just one of those things. And on top of that, he left the game late, obviously went to the locker room in overtime with a shoulder injury. He's needed surgery on that shoulder pretty much his entire career and has told me that, you know, he's he's not going to address that shoulder issue until he retires. Now, you know, that was the first thing I thought of when I saw it was a right shoulder. And you guys know he's been wearing that brace for for years now on his right shoulder. I wonder if maybe there's a possibility that he just decides, hey, I can't I don't want to play with pain anymore. He's he's played with pain throughout his whole career. He's not a guy who's who's ever willing to admit it. Um, but that shoulder has been an issue throughout his whole career. And I wonder if, you know, if it's, I think if it's a torn labrum, I, I don't want to say for, uh, w- with any certainty on what exactly the injury is, but I just know he's needed surgery on it for years now. And I wonder if that contributed to, because it did look like, um, you know, he was in pain, uh, at, at times throughout that game, obviously going to the locker room. So I wonder if that contributed to, and if George Kittle will ultimately decide, Hey, maybe I should, maybe I should spend an off season getting this shoulder taken care of. So it's less painful going forward. Chris Biederman, thank you so much for a great season, man. We will talk to you soon, and hopefully the Niners will finally get to the mountaintop. I appreciate you guys for having me. It's been fun, and I look forward to seeing you guys at the next Kings game. Yes. All right, he got to get to a break. When we get back, starting our Kings talk, Kyle Kuzma. Chris and I spent how many hours talking about him? Too many. Turns out it was never going to be a thing. Styles and Watkins, Sacktown Sports.